Okay, good morning to everybody and uh, thank you for inviting me to address to your meeting. Um, first of all, to your question about the Minister uh, of the Agriculture, I'll just leave you my SIM card also so you can contact me thank you. Uh, too. It's not always that easy, but let's try to, to make some pressure because I do fully agree that this is an issue we should address, but uh, strong. Okay, so I have about 15, 10, 15 minutes, uh, so I'm not going to go through all of the water regulation and fish regulation, what we are having in the EU, but uh, just uh, raising two points. The, uh, another point is the general regulation and atmosphere about the protection of the fish species. And then the another one is the water framework directive and its uh, implementation in the uh, member states. But uh, if I start uh, directly with the fish, I would say that uh, we are sort of in, in interim period. Because before the Lisbon Treaty that entered in the force 2009, the fisheries policies were on the competencies of the member states and of the internal negotiations. After the Lisbon Treaty, now it is the community method and community competence. This has been uh, very tough and difficult, as you might guess, for the member states, as there <coughs> several cases uh, in the uh, in community court also where the issues are dealt, and the commission, uh, commission is having continuous struggle with the member states. And okay, in general level, uh, how it uh, works is that uh, <clears throat> the annual quotas are uh, still <coughs> decided by the member states in council level, but the multi-annual management plans are debated on community method. And uh, actually, as you might know, if you take it with the precautionary principle, one could say, that almost 90% of our fish stocks are endangered. So this is a serious matter. And we have, a, from uh, north to south, uh, from east to west, more or less we have all the fishing of uh, the endangered species. And uh, uh, the, the species have the uh, uh, cautions. So what have we been uh, doing and what can we do? Of course, the foremost is the multi-annual management uh, plan and uh, setting uh, binding uh, commitments on uh, uh, yearly uh, fishing uh, amounts so that the amount shouldn't, and it should be legally binding, shouldn't exceed the amount of uh, the carrying capacity, that means the capacity of the fish stocks to reproduce the same, the same amount of species. Plus, uh, there's several species where actually, and actually the salmon comes very close to that, we should have a moratorium of fishing for a couple of years to have the possibility for these stocks to recover. And this uh, is still uphill, uh, uphill battle, and it is uphill battle when it comes to uh, uh, the professional fisheries and the subsidies for new vessel and the subsidies in general for this. This is very uh, hard in other uh, levels also. And this is the issue of the discards. Substantial amount of the fish, can you imagine at the same time when the, actually one could say the fish is more endangered globally than uh, actually the mammals are. We are discarding a huge amount of the fish. And the limit uh, for the discard uh, proposed by the council was 9% of the maximum. And uh, after the uh, negotiations with the parliament, we ended up to 5%. This is substantial improvement. And with the discard issue, we can actually solve quite a, quite a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the uh, problems on, on the use of the fish in the long term. Uh, you might know that the amount of the discard nowadays is about one fourth of the catch is thrown out as, as 
these charts. So, yeah. uh, in European Union's region, so, and uh, at average, at average, yes, at, at average, and it's clo close to that figure, at average, globally too. Uh, we do not have actually very uh, reliable data on regional uh, figures on, on the this, uh, charts, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Then I wouldn't go in detail about the zone, I was going to say something about it, but I heard that uh, there's actually rather uh, extensive uh, and exhaustive uh, intervention on that already. But that of course when, it, when you are looking at the <coughs> things, and for the sectors, it is one of the uh, biggest issues or the biggest issue. The other one is of course the God, but there we are more uh, on, on a balanced situation when it comes to regulation, but the solvent is an issue. It is issue with the member states, especially uh, from the Finnish perspective, uh, we would name, uh, uh, name the uh, Denmark and the Poland, not willing to agree not to talk about the moratoriums, but that uh, uh, even on, on uh, limiting the year-nil uh, quotas, uh, uh, quotas. But actually in Finland, I think that we will need to, to change up the attitudes as, as well. So this is sort of an overall uh, question. The question is about the extent uh, of the uh, attitudinal uh, problem. Um, then, uh, if I look at the uh, fisheries policies in the long term, where I see the important uh, policies coming is the multi-annual framework uh, for the quotas. Then I, I think that we should have a legally binding maximum sustainable yield per year. That should be binding on the quota levels, on annual uh, levels. And on the list of uh, in, uh, endangered species, we actually should have a policy of moratoriums. We are not close to that, but if we compare the situation, let's say, five or six years ago, we have had and we made significant improvements and steps forward, especially uh, thanks to the European Parliament, where it has been up to battle, as you can imagine, too. Then I would like to uh, tell you a few words uh, about the Water Framework uh, Directive. I don't know how familiar you are with this, but uh, to start with the naive example, the fish needs water. I, I just tell you the break you the news uh, that uh, the fish need uh, fish do need a clean water, and the humans need to clean. The problem uh, for a long time, in uh, generally in our environmental politics, has been this kind of a silo approach that has been very difficult to achieve the results. So you have a per emission limits, you have a per substance uh, approach, and you have a like legislative tools per area or per substance or per emission uh, origin. And more and more the European Union is trying to uh, do this kind of integrated, systematic approach to environment. And this is very much in need, and it is a very good uh, approach. The problem is that it is hard to get it legally binding in the same way that in uh, sectoral legislation you can set a emission limit and then you can control it. And then you say, can say whether you uh, exceed or you don't exceed, <coughs> whether you follow certain procedures or not. Anyway, so this is the crux of the problem with the Water Framework Directive as well. So it is a good tool. It sets an uh, ambitious level that is rather fast, 2015, when European waters should be in good quality. I'm sort of having a wild guess that we are not going to be there within of, uh, six months or even within 12 months if we would have the amount of the time. But anyway, uh, it uh, includes uh, the inland surface waters, ground waters, transi uh, transitional waters and coastal waters. 
the idea there is that you would uh, look holistically all the sources of emissions to the waters. That mean, means agriculture. We lost the case in the European Parliament, the, the uh, water framework directive binding on a common agricultural policy. That would have meant that it would have been possible to limit or exclude uh, individual farmers if they do not obey the uh, crown blue, uh, rules and the guidance of water framework directive and its applications uh, uh, directions uh, to, to lose the uh, funding. Okay, we didn't get that. But then again, the idea is that uh, every member state should have a clear picture of the quality of their wa uh, waters firstly. Finland, for example, has this one very well. Then they should have a follow-up mechanism how they follow up the quality of the waters. Secondly, they should have an integrative uh, approach to what are the sources of the poly uh, pollution and the burning, burning of the waters. Follow-up processes on there. And thirdly, the effective implementation mechanism and plan and follow-up how to tackle these issues. Okay, then when we look at the case, it is a bit of the different depending uh, on, on the area of the EU. We have, uh, of course, the industrial emissions in some part of the Eastern European, for example, in the Donau region and the Rhine region, they are significant uh, source, for example, in, uh, in Finland, not that much anymore because we have targeted effective uh, legislation that is actually a good part to see how, how you function uh, with that. Then you have the municipal wastewaters. There we have uh, things uh, we need, to, need to, to do future actions in Finland as well, but especially when you go to Eastern European countries and in some parts of the Central European countries. This is a big issue. And actually, this is the second one, very easy, sort of end of the pipeline technology that you can use. And then, actually, uh, you can quite beneficially there also catch the phosphorus and nitrogen that are going to be very uh, limited resources of fertilizers in the future. But then when uh, we come to the next levels that are tougher and more important, and that is agriculture, forestry, other sources, habitation, and recreational use of the waters. The first step actually there should be the very good physical planning. But there the EU doesn't have the competencies, so it is only solely on the competencies of the member states. But if you don't look when you plan the cities, uh, habitations, whatever activities. If you don't look the waters, the land and water use, you actually can't achieve uh, any results. And this has been a, a tough issue in various places, I would say, in all of our member states, and this includes Finland uh, also. Then the second one is the agriculture. Actually, this is a very easy one and very sad one because I referred to you about uh, the uh, scarce resources of the uh, fertilizers, the nitrogen and the phosphorus and what do we actually see as problems in our waters. So it wouldn't see very much, uh, seem to be very much sense to, to, to waste something you are always going to be scarce in the <coughs> near future and then again spoil something that is going to be scarce in the future to simultaneous. And we had very good and effective measures there. And the new and best one are going to be the biorefineries. And actually this was used to have been part of the common agricultural policy, for example, and the funding mechanism. What I mean by that is that we could, uh, you, we could create, uh, depends a bit of the area of the Europe, we could create uh, up to 20% or up to 30% of our energy needs from waste from agriculture. 
and not that process actually. You would produce electricity, biogas, and plus you would produce the fertilizers. Plus you would exclude the problem from our waters. And this as a solely action what should be done in Finland and across the Europe is I think at the moment one of the most and crucial ones what, uh, what we can do and we need to do to save uh, the quality of our waters. Then when it comes to habitation and recreational mm -hmm. use, this is very much the physical planning and this is high hopes and visits and hope, hope you can pressurize your governments to, to do that. Uh, then thirdly, there are specific uh, sources of uh, uh, pollution or uh, baggage for the waters and in Finland, of course, guess what that is? Beep. But this is very much uh, our internal problem, but anyway, a good example how you can have this kind of a targeted sources that are significant uh, and actually easy to tackle. Because if you would uh, deal with the beet uh, extraction as you deal with any other sources of a production, that would mean that you need refineries for the water. Again, what you would get, you would get fertilizers. What would you get? You would get clean waters. And uh, this seems to be very uh, tough. Uh, issue to, uh, to deal and the EU is not going to help us very much there because the beat is more or less this kind of exotic issue for the Finns and Irish and uh, it, it's hard, hard to justify to have a beat regulation in the EU and people are more reliant that we deal with our own problems ourselves. So the management plans uh, uh, had to be implemented in 2012 what the number of the member, member states have been lagging behind that and uh, have had the notifications uh, from the Commission and uh, uh, Finland has been uh, among <coughs> those countries. <coughs> then actually what we are looking uh, forward in the uh, next coming term is to have the review of the Water, water Framework Directive and to have the review of the state of the waters in the Europe and I'm actually afraid that this review is not going to show us uh, a significant uh, improvement. To conclude, what then is the problem with the, this kind of a, uh, action plans and framework directive is that it is very hard to get this kind of illegally binding cases on, on them. Because how would you sue Finland in the uh, European Union's court? on not implementing water uh, framework directly. Because you can show, yes, you have a, a map uh, of the sources, yes, you have a good data about the quality of the sources, yes, you have implemented because you have the plan of the next steps, yes, you are following up with them, yes, you are doing all that. But you, because it's a framework, you just can't go and identify and say, I'm suing to, you to the court because you are dealing with the beef. Or I'm suing you to the court because your physical planning is in poor quality. And uh, this is uh, then uh, with this holistic uh, approach uh, problems that, uh, that we are having and uh, then the next steps that are considered are more stringent uh, norms for the uh, quality of the uh, inland waters uh, and uh, sea waters uh, also maybe in the uh, future, but uh, there, there it, it is quite a lot of uh, with the uphill battle as, as well. I hope that this has addressed uh, a bit of your interest. Uh, all the best uh, and successful fishing trips to all of you, and thank you for existing. Because I, I think that this is one of the best and most precious ways of using our fishing and fisheries instead of uh, wasting it as a discharge, uh, discard, or instead of uh, just producing some mink uh, or other fish feed out of what we get out of our waters. 
So I'm, I'm looking forward on, on your reactions in the future too, and if there's any way I can help you, if you can provide me with uh, good information, proposals, just uh, please do regard me as uh, one of your good contacts. Thank you. Sustainable fisheries group that you probably know that uh, it is in the European Parliament already. There we are dealing very much of, uh, of the fish stocks issues and uh, issues that are related on that. <coughs> okay, two good questions. First of all, about the Baltic salmon. And the problem is that uh, right now uh, the Baltic salmon is a red book of Russia, but the fishery agency of Russia is going to open commercial fishing again. And they refer to another Baltic Sea countries doing this. So if you will try to stop this type of fishing, or at least to declare this as a goal, it will be much easier not to open fishing for Baltic salmon in the Baltic Sea from the Russian side. And my colleagues from the Baltic Salmon Center are ready to participate in the process. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, this is about Norwegian making for mixed stock of Atlantic salmon. Uh, in the market. It affects not only the region and Russian Europe, but also the population of the and the Yoke. Okay. So uh, I think the European Parliament and especially the representative from Finland should be more active to organize this pressure to Norway to stop this. this thank, you. thank you. I'm happy to get uh, all of these comments because of course I can't be an expert on all the details about the, the different fish stocks and actions that are going on. And as you say, you most likely get probably uh, sooner some information <coughs> that we do. This is the reason we would not need this kind of very, very good exchange of information. Hi, sir. For Glenn Douglas from the Sport Fisk, Sport Fisk in our Swedish National Angling Association. Just uh, one of our concerns now is now, and it's good you as a European parliamentarian uh, is aware of this, and can perhaps help us, and that is, of course, now is a regionalisation program for fishing, and of course, bulk fish is going to be taken for among others the Europe, uh, the Baltic salmon. Probably quotas will be decided within bulk bulk fish, or discussed within bulk fish for among other salmon. And for us, uh, transparency within bulk fish is going to be very important for us, so we see and understand what's being discussed in bulk fish and we feel that we have a, an honest and uh, true chance of giving a good input to bulk fish. So uh, the regionalization program has started now. Uh, I'm not going to write it off yet, but this transparency issue is going to become very important mm -hmm. for us and especially you as a parliamentarian, you'll understand that. If you could help us with that, that would be really great. Mm -hmm. Get any from 
being being tactless. Um, one thing we did not mention that I think is a serious problem, especially in the minority countries, is the issue of fish passage because of the large amounts of hydropower uh, dams that intercept fish migration to the flooding ground. It's not just in the minority countries, but certainly Austria, Switzerland have the same problem. And I think the water framework directive uh, has an issue as a area in there that it looks at fish passage or hydromorphology or something like that. But that's another really tough issue. Uh, in the United States, all the relicensing of, of hydropower dams have to put in fish passage or removal dams. And that's been very contentious and very expensive, but uh, we're now removing a lot of dams across the country. Do uh, you see that happening in Europe? I mean, it's mostly for salmon and other migratory fish, but partly also because the dams are dangerous. They're old and they're falling apart. But uh, is there a requirement for fish passing to all dams? If not, there should be. Uh, there's a recommendation. Yeah. Okay, a recommendation. There should be. Yeah. And this is the direction uh, where we are moving and what we are discussing. But uh, it is uh, a very debated issue in, uh, in Europe, and of course it's very Nordic issue as, uh, as we know. Uh, gradually, uh, quite a number of the dams have been doing that, but still we are sort of uh, having a discussion about new dams also without, uh, without the requirements. Plus then uh, there are small dams that actually don't have this kind of a big, uh, big importance, nor on the uh, energy wise nor on the heat wise. But then again you are starting to look at them as, as this kind of a historical structures. And then actually when they would need to be a requirement of the uh, removal and uh, recovery of the area, then you start this kind of an old debate that actually you should uh, protect this skull almost natural <coughs> site and to use the energy <coughs> even though it doesn't have that much of an impact on that, uh, that uh, side of either. Thank you very much, So thank you very much. I have some of my cards here, so uh, if any of uh, you, you are interested, and if you have this kind of information, you would find useful for, for European Parliament. I'm more than happy to, to, to have it from you. I'm really embarrassed that I don't have any gift, but I promise to go for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best gift, <laughs>